How are you my student and how are you doing? This is Dr. Sami and for today we want to go through the KCSC 2021 Chemistry Paper 1. Kindly watch the video to the end uh, because I have good stuff for you. Actually I even have a nutshell of CBC, the new system of education in Kenya. And uh, first, we go through the questions. So my students, just stop the video, go through the question you solve, then we revise the questions together. Thank you. And here is the question paper as uh, it was presented to students. Uh, maybe the cover page, the student was expected to write his name, index number, signature, and the date the exam was done. Then the instructions, read the instructions. Uh, this is a paper one, short structured questions with uh, at most five marks. That is uh, maybe a question with the two marks, three, four, and at most five. Short structured question. This time round, the paper had 27 questions. That is question number one. Yeah, question number two there, you can see with the three marks, it has three parts. Question number three with the two parts there. Going ahead with question number four, it has uh, three parts, the three marks. Question number five, then question number six, you can see it, three marks in total. Question number seven, uh, then question number uh, eight, seven continues, uh, then number eight, uh, question number nine, going ahead, con number nine continues, number 10, yes, question number 11, question number 12 there, you can see it, organic chemistry. Then question number 13, sulfur. Question number 14 there, energy changes. Question number 15, that's a mole concept. You're going ahead to question number 16, that is acid, base, and salts. Uh, then question number 17, uh, yes, you can see there the question, uh, qualitative analysis. Question number 18, question number 19, you can see there. Question number 20, that is uh, radioactivity. Question 20 continues. Then question 21, uh, electrolysis, that is uh, under electrochemistry. Then question number 22, question number 23, you can see it there. Question number 24, 25, yes, 26. Then 27, the uh, very last question there. Kindly stop the video, try the questions yourself, then uh, shortly we go through the questions together. Thank you. Good. Let us go through the paper together. And uh, question number one. With question number one, you're given the representation of a magnesium nuclide. Or rather, you have magnesium with atomic number 12, a mass number of 24. You are to draw, the student was expected to draw the atomic representation of magnesium. If atomic number is 12, it means the number of protons are 12. The mass number is 24, so to get the number of neutrons, you subtract 24 minus 12. So that is how the nucleus was to look like for one whole mark. And that is a half for protons, a half for neutrons. Then you consider the electron arrangement. This is a magnesium atom, and that means the protons and electrons are equal. So you arrange the first energy level to accommodate two electrons, the second one to take eight, then the remaining two electrons in the outermost energy level, just like I've drawn there. Number one, part B. The student was expected to draw a dot and cross diagram for a compound formed between phosphorus, atomic number 15, and chlorine, atomic number 17. These two elements are nonmetals, so they will bond covalently. They will bond covalently. What you need to do is to write the electron arrangement of phosphorus, 2, 8, 5. So that atom has five valence electrons. Then chlorine, 2, 8, 7. That atom has seven electrons in the outermost energy level. So chlorine requires to gain one. So they are going to share a pair of electron, each chlorine, like I've indicated there. So three chlorines sharing a pair of uh, electrons each with phosphorus to make a maximum of six electrons. Then a valence electrons that you can see the two crosses remains outside for phosphorus. 
what exactly we call the lone pair of electrons. And the structure of uh, phosphorus tetrachloride is as I've indicated, or the one to the right there for one mark. Question number two, I remember about the Bunsen burner, this is one of the video I uploaded uh, some times back. You're supposed to state the condition under which the burner will produce luminous flame. It is when the air hole is fully uh, closed. The air hole is fully closed for one mark. That's a form one question. Introduction to chemistry, a very easy question to answer there. And I've just said I uploaded a video on luminous and non-luminous flame. Question two, part B. You are told to assume that you're using butane and then you adjust your Bunsen burner to produce a luminous flame. You close the air hole. You suppose the student was expected to draw the equation or rather to the student was expected to write the equation for the reaction that will take place remember this is where now the gas will undergo in complete combustion to produce soot or carbon then carbon two oxide and water so the two equations uh will all could have served as an answer remember for equations they must be balanced and state symbols well indicated Question number three, still on the, the issue of the flame, you are supposed to describe how you can confirm that the innermost region of a non-luminous flame is basically unburnt gases. And uh, strictly, you suppose the student was supposed to use a wooden splint. So what the student was to do is just to slip a wooden splint uh, over slightly above the chimney for about two, three, four seconds then remove when that happens the observation on the right you can see there there, there are two parts the two parts will be burnt or charred uh, uh, on the wooden splint and that means the center will not be burnt meaning the center region is not hot and that means it is composed of the unburnt gases the hotter region of the non-luminous flame is of course the outer region the pale blue zone with question number three you're given three elements magnesium sodium and then aluminium actually in the order sodium magnesium aluminium group one group two group three respectively so you state which one has the highest conductivity automatically that is aluminium if you write the electron arrangement two eight three the one for magnesium two eight uh two the one for sodium two eight one automatically aluminium has more delocalized electrons in its structure a per atom three electrons so therefore it will have the highest conductivity question three part uh, b you're given uh, that table you're supposed to fill in the table by stating the product that will be formed when you do electrolysis of concentrated sodium chloride and molten sodium chloride for that case we start with concentrated sodium chloride at the anode, there are two anions, the chlorides and the OH. But because you're talking about concentrated sodium chloride, the concentration of chlorides is far too high. And therefore, the chlorides will preferentially be discharged, or rather will be discharged preferentially. That one concentration will play the key role there. Then we come to the cathode of the same concentrated sodium chloride at the cathode two cations for that matter, hydrogen ions and sodium ions. So with that case, though the concentration of sodium ions is higher, now the position of the ions in the electrochemical series will apply. So for this case, uh, sodium will not be discharged. Rather, hydrogen ions will be discharged because if you consider that they have a, an E value of zero, sodium has a more negative and that means sodium, sodium uh, metal is less of an oxidizing agent, so it will not be discharged. So I think the student, what you should do is to revise that area as much as possible. Uh, molten sodium chloride. With molten sodium chloride, this is a binary electrolyte. An electrolyte containing only two types of ion. One cation, one anion. So the anion that is their chloride directly will go to at the cathode. Sodium ions will be discharged and sodium metal will be produced.
maybe something very interesting the student need to understand like when you're doing electrolysis of concentrated sodium chloride at the anode you're discharging chloride at the cathode you're discharging hydrogen so in short you're removing the hydrogen and chlorine so what remains sodium and hydroxide so this is this one can lead to the manufacture of sodium hydroxide an alkaline solution the electrolytes becomes more uh, alkaline then go to question number four question number four again when i started my work of uh, teaching students through youtube this is the very first uh, video i uploaded on this very same channel the reaction of sodium metal with water and uh, the student was expected to state the observations that will be made if this experiment is carried out obviously like you can review that video you can see sodium floats on the surface of water darts over there sodium melts into a silvery ball a hissing sound will be produced or effervescence you can talk of bubbles as well then the beaker feels warm if at all you can feel otherwise i have attached this video next here uh, courtesy of uh, uh, the school called north carolina schools of science and mathematics and it will help you and i've also attached a small bit of what i had uploaded before that you can see the visual of uh, that reaction of sodium and water i'm going to drop it in water basically the observation i can see few sort of colors that's in here the hissing sound it's dirty on the surface of water. The product that has been formed, it is thick in color. Just like other alkali metals, sodium is stored in paraffin oil. Then uh, you can see there a piece of sodium. You try to cut it, soft metal, shiny surface that tarnish after a short time. Sodium is a metal, therefore, it will conduct electricity. Yes, if you, you go on. Uh, talking about sodium reacting with water a small piece as you can see it immediately melts into a silvery ball it darts on the surface of water there are some fumes of a colorless gas as you can see of course and the hissing sound is produced then if you try to tap the gas that is coming out and then bring it in contact with a flame it will extinguish the flame with a pop sound Okay, if uh, phenolphthalein is introduced to the mixture above, that is after now sodium has reacted with water, the student was to state the observation. Just like I've attached on this video, the, 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 the indicator phenolphthalein will change from colorless to pink, indicating that sodium hydroxide solution formed is alkaline. With the number four, part uh, C. The student again was to explain why it is not advisable to use potassium for this experiment, for the above experiment. Basically, potassium reacts explosively with water or more vigorously with water. Again, I have attached this video for you to just see the video. Potassium, another very soft metal, softer than sodium. Yes, if you place a very small piece in water, you can see what exactly happens. A very explosive process. Yeah, you can see very vigorous. The purple color is hydrogen burning because of the high temperature produced there. You can see it is exploding. The solution formed alkaline as usual. Good. You can still watch this one from Emilia. You can see that. Wow. Very explosive. With question number five, the student was supposed to describe how to obtain pure copper 2 nitrate crystals using recycled copper wire. Maybe the trick here was the student was not to take copper and react with an acid for for instance nitric acid because copper does not react with dilute acids now what the student was to do first is to heat the wire until he or she obtains copper 2 oxide now the copper 2 oxide can be di uh, reacted with the dilute nitric 5 acid and then the student will obtain copper 2 nitrate solution then filter out the unreacted copper 2 oxide. Alternatively, the, re the student can react copper with hot concentrated nitric 5 acid. That is 50% uh, nitric acid. And then, of course, filter out the unreacted copper. The aim of this step is to obtain copper 2 nitrate solution. Then the student is proceed and heat the solution to saturation, ensure the 
solution is saturated, allow it to cool, and after some time, then the crystals are formed. Of course, you filter out the mother liquor, then uh, uh, the student is to obtain the crystals and dry them in the sun, or other using filter papers. Question number six. Uh, the student was provided with a setup and the necessary uh, substance here that can be used to determine or investigate the percentage air that is used when iron rusts. The iron filings were provided, a hundred measuring cylinder, a trough, and then water. And this is simple, form one work. If, for, ex for example, a student has studied this diagram in book one, you can see this diagram somewhere on, in one of the pages. And what exactly was the student to do? Just take the measuring cylinder, moisten it, then apply some iron filings at the bottom. Then immediately you overturn that uh, measuring cylinder on a trough containing some water. Then after some time, maybe 24 hours, you monitor the increase or the rise in the volume of water inside the measuring cylinder. As simple as that. Part B, if you want to determine the percentage air that has been used, the initial height of the measuring cylinder above the water, then you subtract the final because now the volume of water inside the cylinder will rise. You subtract now the new height of the water inside the uh, cylinder. Then divide by the initial uh, height or column, multiplied by 100. And that's how you obtain now the percentage oxygen or other air used. Question number seven, a graphical question there. A very interesting one there. We have a graph of atomic radius in nanometer, then uh, against the atomic na number. Now you have the four elements that are given, lithium atomic number three, beryllium atomic number four, you have uh, sodium, yes, atomic number 11, magnesium atomic number 12, and even the trends are given. But here you are to state why the atomic radius of sodium uh, is higher than that of sodium. What you expected to do is just to write the electron arrangement. And once you do the electron arrangement, you can see the sodium has three energy levels, lithium has two. So automatically sodium has a big atom. Why the atomic radius of sodium is higher than that of magnesium? That is for the second now part. In this case, the electron arrangement will not help you. But you need to know that with, from the diagram, magnesium has 12 elect, uh, protons. That means it has a higher nuclear charge. So the energy levels will be attracted even closer. And that means the magnesium atom will be smaller compared to that of sodium. Then you are to do a prediction. You predict the atomic radius of calcium. Yes, you predict atomic radius of calcium using the graph. So what the student was expected to do is to extrapolate the line starting from beryllium to magnesium all the way. And where the line will meet atomic number 20 for calcium, the student was to read the corresponding atomic radius. Just like I've done, follow the atomic radius 20 up to where you'll meet the extrapolated line there, and then you read. It will be 208 uh, nanometer there. And of course, you're given an allowance, plus, uh, plus or minus uh, two, uh, that is a nanometer so that you have the room for that. Otherwise, the line must be drawn. The extrapolation line must be on the graph for you to earn the second half mark there. Okay, with question number eight, you're given a compound D. The formula is given C3H4. And you told that this one was reacted with excess HCl gas. Part A, you identify, give just the name of this uh, compound D. The structure was not necessary, but I am giving you the structure so that you can see what exactly that name means. This substance or another compound D can simply be a propyne, otherwise prop one ion, that is an alkyne. All the same, it can be a prop one to diene. If you look at the structures the two have given, they have three carbons and four hydrogen. So the, the compound D can either be the one of the two. And with part B, you have to give now the products, the possible products uh, for this reaction when you react the D with excess HCl gas. Now we can have the first one. If I can name it, it is a 2,2 dichloropropane. 
and that one obey what we call the Makovnikov rule. Maybe for high schoolers even mentioning that uh, may scare them. But that rule states that if you're reacting an organic compound with a double bond that is with HCl gas, for instance, a hydro, uh, hydrogen halide, the hydrogen atom will go to the carbon containing more hydrogen. So like in this case, across the triple bond, the carbon to the right has a hydrogen. So the hydrogen, both the hydrogen will be attached there. Remember in this case, the propane is reacting with the two moles of HCl gas. So, and then that will just give you the compound I've given there. But it can still obey, it, it can undergo what you call anti Markovnikov, whatever rule. That means the hydrogen, it's now going to the carbon with the less hydrogen. And you can see now you'll have a one, one, Dichlorofluoropropane. The third compound there, you can have one obeying the Markovnikov, the other one no, not obeying. So you'll have a one, two, dichlorofluoropropane. With uh, the fourth one, it's when you're talking about the prop one, two, diene. That one, when it reacts with the two moles of HCl gas, you get the compound I've given there. It is a one, three, uh, three, dichlorofluoropropane. I think uh, my students, those who don't like uh, organic chemistry, they hear me talk in tongues. <laughs> Good, we go on, number nine. Number nine, you're given that figure. That figure, we having a flame somewhere. Carbon two oxide is being ignited. The product tapped through uh, the funnel there, then goes through calcium hydroxide, that's lime water, then out through the sanction pump there. Question one. You state one precaution that should be taken when you're carrying out this experiment. This one should be carried out in a fume chamber, all in open. Why? Carbon four, this carbon two. Carbon two oxide is a very poisonous gas. With part B, you state the observation that were made inside the boiling tube. Over here, a white precipitate will be formed. Remember what exactly is happening. I've indicated for you the reaction taking place on the flame. Carbon four oxide is being produced. And when carbon four oxide react with the lime water, calcium hydroxide, then you get calcium carbonate, the white uh, precipitate there, and water will be produced. Um, maybe after some time, not maybe, but after some time, then the colorless solution is formed. And that means, like I've indicated in the second equation, though the equation were not asked for this case, the calcium carbonate and water continues to react with the CO2 and then forms calcium hydrogen carbonate, which is a very soluble salt. That's why the PPT just dissolves. Going on to number 10, you're given uh, an a question at the equilibrium there, and you're told that the enthalpy change for one mole of nitrogen is negative uh, 92.4 kilojoules. Now, you are supposed to look at that equation very well. One mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen to give you two moles of ammonia for the forward reaction. Then you are to give the enthalpy change per mole of ammonia. Ammonia, when you compare with this nitrogen, the mole ratio of nitrogen to ammonia is one is to two. And that means what you're given is for nitrogen. So if you're giving the one for ammonia, it is the one for nitrogen divided by two. And that uh, gives you negative 46.2 kilojoules per mole of ammonia. Then you go ahead, part B, uh, you state what will happen if we increase temperature for this system. What will happen to the yield of ammonia? The ammonia product or the, the, the yield will lower or will be lower. Why? Increasing the temperature, if you consider the forward reaction, it is exothermic. If you increase the temperature for an exothermic reaction, you discourage the reaction from proceeding. And of course, the reverse happens. If you increase the temperature for an endothermic reaction, you are encouraging it. And in this case, therefore, we are encouraging the backward reaction. Less and less ammonia will be produced. Actually, ammonia will be decomposing to form nitrogen and hydrogen. What happens? That is part B, Roman 2. If we introduce finely divided ion, this one is a catalyst for this uh, process, for Haber process. It will have no effect on the equilibrium. A catalyst does not affect the... Good, uh, that is question number 11. You have a flowchart, you have to study the flowchart, then go ahead and answer the questions. Now, we have the solid E. 
and concentrated concentrated yes concentrated hydrochloric acid in chamber one when they react chlorine is produced so automatically solid is a good oxidizing agent that uh, oxidizes the hcl to produce chlorine gas uh, in chamber two we have so cold actually it should be cold sodium hydroxide cold aqueous sodium hydroxide reacting with chlorine gas then part a you are to identify that oxidizing agent it can either be a potassium manganate 7 manganese 4 oxide can work even lead to uh that's lead 4 oxide can also work uh with part b the name of reagent the type of reagent in that chamber one it's a redox reaction or other an oxidation process the equation in chamber two here you need to understand two scenario when chlorine is reacting with cold uh, aqueous sodium hydroxide and when chlorine is reacting with hot concentrated sodium hydroxide they give you different uh, bleaching powder or uh, bleaching substances there so like the one we were asked to write it is the first one that gives you sodium chloride sodium uh, chloride and water otherwise if it was sodium hydroxide was hot and concentrated we ought to have obtained sodium chloride sodium chlorate and water kindly note that because maybe next time they'll be talking about hot and concentrated question number 12 an organic uh, chemistry question there we were to name the two compound compound h compound j compound h look at the oh somewhere that is your carbon number one it is an alkano actually this one counting the number of carbons one two three four five so and of course at carbon number three there is a branch a methyl so start by identifying the branch and its position then name the parent alkano that is a three methyl pentan one all then we come to roman two j j looking at it there is a, a carboxylic group at the end so that is a, a an alkanoic acid a butanoic acid because it has four carbons there condition necessary for j that is an alkano and an alkanoic acid to react that's a esterification we need drops of concentrated sulfuric acid and we need to warm the temperature of 30 to 60 here question number 13 we're talking about sulfur rhombic sulfur the shape of rhombic sulfur octahedral just like it is indicated there question b Yes, one question that uh, the examiners and teachers and students felt like uh, the examiner, those who tested the, the setters, were too harsh on the student. Now, for this one, the student could have explained without necessarily quoting the temperature. That's why I've just written them in black. You have to describe what happens when you burn rhombic sulfur from room temperature all the way to the time it boils. Sulfur is yellow. It turns into amber liquid. Uh, with low viscosity when you keep increasing the temperature the liquid will darken becomes red brown there and then becomes more viscous when you continue heating it turns black almost dark now and then it becomes less viscous before it boils and gives out dark brown or reddish vapor at 444 maybe the student was not necessarily to quote the temperature but at least explain what happens the funny behavior when when you hit sulfur you know sulfur is not like other substance that it, it will melt directly first of all it will melt then becomes a solid then goes ahead to boil question number 14 yes you're given the molar heat of solution of potassium sulfate yes positive 23.8 kilojoules there so the student was to draw the energy level diagram representing this change so you have it is an endothermic reaction so with an endothermic reaction the reactants will be lower the products will be higher as you, you can see here so i will represent it there the i there represent the activation energy for this one you could have even drawn without it without the i without the hump and still that could have given you the one and a half mark there just like i've drawn with part b uh you're calculating the enthalpy change that occur when 5.22 grams of potassium sulfate is completely dissolved in dissolved in water then this one you need to watch the attached video and it will guide
Okay, you are given the molar heat of solution of potassium sulfate. You're given that. Actually, that is in part A. You're given that the molar heat of solution of this salt is positive 23.8 kilojoules. That one you're given. And the question is, you determine the heat change that will occur if this person dissolves 5.22 grams of the same salt. Now, what do you do? You first of all work out the relative formula mass of the salt, potassium sulfate. Of course, by adding the relative atomic mass, and by doing that, you get a half a mark. Then you can go ahead and work out the moles of potassium sulfate that were used. So you do the division here, 5.22 divided by the relative formula mass, and you get the number of moles there, 0. 0.03 moles. Therefore, now you can use the first principle and argue out if one mole of potassium sulfate generates a heat or rather there is a heat change of 23.8 kilojoules, what about this number of moles, 0 0.03? And the student goes ahead here to do the cross multiplication here and then end, uh, ends up with the answer here. Remember, the student can decide not even to work out the number of moles and then argue out. After working out the relative formula mass, can argue out 174 grams gives us 23.8 kilojoules. When dissolved, this is the amount of heat. What about 5.22 grams? So still this one can work because the student will do 5.22 multiplied by 23.8 divided by 174. Actually, you can see the number of moles, the 0 0.03 is already there. So the student can decide to combine the two steps just like I've done. So that's question number 14b. Question number 15, the gay lussacs law. When gases do react, they do so in vo uh, volumes that will bear simple ratio to, to each other and that of the product if the product has, is, is a gas as well, provided the temperature and pressure are kept constant. You're given that 180 cubic centimeters of nitrogen 2 oxide gas reacted with 400 of oxygen. Then the equation part B Roman 1, you can see the equation. Nitrogen 2 oxide reacts with oxygen to give you nitrogen 4 oxide. Well balanced state sim symbols indicated. Calculate the total volume of the gas at the end of the reaction. Again, the attached video here will help you to see what is happening. This one is application of the gay lussacs law. gay lussacs law. What we exactly be doing, we are combining nitrogen 2 oxide with oxygen to get nitrogen 4 oxide. Just a complete oxidation of nitrogen 2 oxide. Now, the question has stated clearly that we are starting with 180 cubic centimeters of nitrogen 2 oxide that is combined, that is combined with 400, it is 400 cubic centimeters of oxygen. And of course, now the question is, you calculate the total volume of the gases that were in that container at the end of the reaction. Now, where exactly do we start? The gay lussacs law states very clearly that volume will bear simple ratios to each other for all the reactants and the products. Of course, you can see they are gases. Now, if you're talking about 180 cubic centimeters of nitrogen 2 oxide, that means by the start of the reaction, I have 180. Of course, by the start of the reaction, I have 400 of oxygen. I have zero. This one, I have zero for nitrogen four oxide. At the end of the reaction, the 180 will have reacted. So I'll have zero. According to the more ratio here, two moles of nitrogen two oxide requires one mole of oxygen for complete oxidation there. Therefore, 180, 180, Yes, 180 divided by 2. So here, 90 cubic centimeters of oxygen will be used up. And that's where the student scores the first half mark. Remember, in that case, there will be a residue oxygen gas remaining. That is 400 minus 90. That is where another, the student scores another half mark. At the end of the reaction, 
if I consider the more ratios, 2s to 2, it means the ratio of nitrogen to oxide, nitrogen for oxide is 1 is to 1. And that means at the end here, I will get 180 cubic centimeters of nitrogen for oxide. According to the more ratio, it is the same ratio as that of nitrogen to oxide. That implies that at the end of the reaction, I have the volume of nitrogen for oxide, which is the product, 180. Then I have the residue oxygen that did not react, 310. If I can add the two, yeah, if I can do the summation, then I get 490. The students cause another a half mark there, making a total of two for that question. So that is how the student was to apply the gay lussacs law to just do that simple question. A question number 16, you're given that setup. And you to the student was to use the setup to explain how you can distinguish between 0 0.2 molar HCl and 0 0.2 molar ethanoic acid with equal volumes. All the student is supposed to do, remember there's a magnesium ribbon given. You place the magnesium ribbon inside the, the conical flask. Once you do that, you can add the first sample of the, the acid. Then start a stopwatch, record the volume of the gas produced at an interval, uh, time interval. Then maybe come up with a graph or do make your observation. You repeat the same using now the second acid sample, ethanoic acid. Monitor the same. The sample of HCl will produce more hydrogen gas or the, the, the gas will be more at the first interval before they level at the same time. Basically, that is what you do. HCl is a strong acid, ethanoic acid is a weak acid. So you, you can be able to argue out that and you get your three free marks. Question number 17, how you can uh, use blue litmus paper and nitric acid to distinguish between a sample of sodium carbonate and sodium sulfate. Sulfite for this case. So what again the student was to do, take each sample, place it in a test tube, differently. Then you place a moist blue litmus paper on the mouth, not inside the test tube, but on the mouth of the, each test tube. Then you do make your observation. What exactly are you going to observe? In both cases, the blue litmus paper will turn to red. And one of them will be bleached. The one that is bleached, it is for the sample containing sodium sulfide. Why sodium sulfide bleaching? Sodium sulfide reacts with an acid like nitric acid in this case, yes, and you obtain sulfur fall oxide that has the bleaching effect. I, I hope you've been able to follow. You know, if the audios are not well guiding, the, the, the writing there, they are also good for you to go through. Question number 18. We describe how we can obtain oil from sunflower. Yes, sunflower seed using propanone form one work kindly my candidates my student do not ignore form one work look at this now the student was to crush the sunflower seed using a mortar and a pestle then add propanone a little at a time then decant the mixture then leave the decant or the, the whatever you have extracted the extract to the sun and for propanone to evaporate you have your oil left on that evaporating dish there. So why can't we use sodium hydroxide instead of propanone? Of course, saponification. We know saponification is where you have an alkali like sodium hydroxide reacting with the oil to give you soap. So automatically sodium hydroxide will react to form a soap and that will not be an extraction process. Question number 19. You're given that 1.5 uh, cubic centimeters of concentrated nitric acid diluted to 500 cubic centimeters, 10 of that, 10 cubic centimeters of that sample required 25 of sodium hydroxide for complete neutralization. So again, you're supposed to calculate the concentration, otherwise this is molality of the dilute acid, molality of the concentrated acid. Again, I have attached the video that will help you. Maybe for part B, before you go through the video, how do you do the dilution process? You do add the acid to water slowly. Not uh, part A Roman one, 
First of all, you need to write an equation. You write an equation for the reaction between nitric acid and sodium hydroxide to get sodium nitrate and water, that neutralization reaction. The more ratio between nitric acid and sodium hydroxide is one is to one. Remember now, in this case, sodium hydroxide is our standard solution because you're given that they're using 25 cubic centimeter and it is a 0 0.4 molar. So this is our standard solution. We're using it to standardize uh, the nitric acid because we are asked to find the concentration of the dilute acid there. With that case, I can decide to go direct and use the formula. Otherwise, I can use the first principle. I can argue out that 1000 cubic centimeter of that solution, sodium hydroxide, contain 0.4 moles, or about 25 centimeter, uh, cubic centimeters. It will be 25 times 0.4 divided by 1000. And that's what exactly I've done here. 0.4 times 25 over 1000. Molality times volume over 1000. And by doing that, we are working out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Then using the mole ratio, I can be able to tell how many moles of nitric acid have I used. The moles of sodium hydroxide is the same as the number of moles of nitric acid there. So with that, I can go ahead and use the formula again or use the first principle and work out the molality. That is the moles times a thousand divided by volume. Remember, we used just 10 of the nitric acid. So the nitric acid volume here was 10 cubic centimeters. So having worked out that, the student was able to get the final answer there. The final answer, of course, the first half was for moles of sodium hydroxide. With part B, part B we are supposed to work out the concentration of what we call the stock solution, the original solution that was diluted to come up with this dilute solution here. And how do I go about that? I can decide to use this formula for dilution. We shall say molality one times the volume one, remember this one, uh, for the stock solution the stock solution, the original solution that you are diluting uh, will be equal to the molality of the new solution that you have diluted multiplied by the more volume of the second solution. So maybe the, you're getting confused, you're wondering what is this and what is exactly happening. Remember how the stem of the question looked like, that 1.5 cubic centimeters of concentrated nitric acid was diluted to make 500 cubic centimeter of a dilute solution. So this is uh, what we call the volume one, and this is what we call the volume two. So already I know this, 31.5, and I know this one is 500, 500. And according to part A, I have already worked molality two. That is the molality of the dilute solution. I have this. So with that, the only thing I do not have is molality one. That's what we are working. So molality one will simply be the molality of the second solution multiplied by the molality of the second solution, the dilute one, divided by the volume of the original solution, the stock solution. And that's how you get this. So working out this and then coming up with the answer 15.9 molar that is how you work out the concentration of the second uh, of part B, the, of the concentrated acid. With the question number 20, it's a question of radioactivity. If the student was able to study this uh, graphical work here, it could have been very easy, and interpret this as I've done down there. You're starting with a nuclide X with the atomic number 82. I've extracted this from the graph and mass of uh, 213. This one, it go undergoes a decay and then forms Y. Atomic number 84, mass 213. Y undergoes a decay and then forms Z. Atomic 82, mass uh, 209. Then Z finally undergoes a decay and forms K, nuclide K. Atomic number 83, mass of 209. Maybe I take you through some radiations. Remind yourself what these radiations mean, like the alpha radiation, the special helium ion. There it is. You can see atomic number two, 
mass of 4. So if a radioactive material emits an alpha particle, what exactly will happen? The mass will reduce by 4. The atomic number will also reduce by 2. If you are talking about a beta particle, a special electron are there. You can see atomic number negative 1, mass of 0. An emission of a beta particle, the mass will remain the same. The atomic number will increase by 1. Remember that is a, a negative atomic number. So on the other side will be adding 1. If we are subtracting 1 on the left hand side, the other side will be adding 1. Now we go back to the graph. What exactly is happening? From x to y, the atomic number has increased by 1. The mass has remained the same. The same. That means that's a beta particle being emitted. In the second case, from y to z, the mass number has in decreased by 4. The atomic number has decreased by 2. So that's an alpha particle. Then from z to k, you can see the mass number has remained the same. The atomic number has increased by 1. So that's a beta particle. So in overall, as you can see there, the equation that you have to write for part A, it is an X nuclide giving you the K nuclide with an emission of one particle of uh, the alpha radiation and two particles of the beta radiation for one mark. Very easy to understand there. Then question number 20, calculation. Then you're given the half-life of nuclide X is 47 minutes. Determine the percentage of nuclide X that remains after 188 minutes. Part B of number 20. You given the half life of a nuclide X, that is the half life 47 minutes. Then you're given the total time that this nuclide is given to decay 188 minutes. So the question is you determine the percentage uh, amount of nuclide X that remain after that uh, time there. So a student can decide to use the first method. Yeah, you can cite the first method and use the formula that the remaining amount in any case will be given by a half raised to n, where n is the total time divided by half life. Yes, multiplied by the original amount. If you're good in mastering the formula, that can be good for you. That can be good for you. Now, 0 0.5, then you have 188 uh, divided by 47, that is 4. So 0 0.5, yeah. 0 0.5 raised to power 4 times 100 and of course if you do this with your calculator you end up with 6.25 uh, percent if the student was to maybe apply like this formula be able to relate the formula then I come over here to divide and get that 4 and of course the operation I think this question uh, had more than enough marks because it is that simple so that one the students called the, the two marks. Alternatively, a student can decide to just work out how many half-lives are there. The total time is here, the half-life is he given. So you divide, you come up with the half-life. Yes. And then you are able to go step by step. Remember, we're starting from a hundred percent. The original amount was a hundred percent. Then uh, from a hundred percent, now you can go reducing by half. The first half-life, 47 minutes, it reduces to 50. Then another half-life, it reduces to 25. Then 12.5. And then eventually, after four half-lives, that is it. One, two, three, four. After four half-lives, a period of 188, the uh, percentage reduces to 6.25%. Still that method for step-by-step, -step, very much accepted. And uh, of course, you score the other half, of course, half, and even the other half. Two good marks for free for a student who has revised uh, radioactivity. Well. Question number 21. Electrolysis of molten aluminum oxide to obtain aluminum. Other than the cost of electricity, why is this process very expensive? Remember, what happens at the anode? Oxygen is produced. Anode is made of carbon, that is graphite. With the, the high temperatures inside the container, graphite, carbon, reacts with oxygen. So, periodically, we are forced to replace the 
anode and that makes it very expensive then part b the question on calculation you're doing electrolysis of aluminium oxide we are passing a current of 20 amperes then for five hours you calculate the mass of aluminium that will be obtained a video there that can help the number 21 part b this is a application of what we call the faraday's law this is a application of uh, faraday's uh, faraday's law yes application of faraday's law you given in this case there is a current of 20 amperes that is passed through that is molten aluminium oxide for five hours so time is five hours so the quantity of electricity yeah in each case quantity of electricity used is always given by current in amperes multiplied by time in seconds and that's what exactly i've done here 20 amperes multiplied by five hours converted to seconds 60 times 60 for a half first half month then the student is able to do very correctly and get 360 thousand kilos or coulombs whichever way you will uh, pronounce that now this is a very important half cell equation that the student must know that for an aluminium atom to be discharged it requires to gain four uh, three electrons yes three electrons to generate one mole of aluminium so that means we translate this to faraday this means three faradays three moles of electrons implies or just simply mean three faradays and one faraday is always given one faraday is equivalent to 96 500 kilos so we're talking about three faradays three faradays and what exactly is three faradays the faraday equivalent all that is uh generating one mole of aluminium and one mole of aluminium is basically 27 grams 27 grams and that's why you equate the three faradays here generates 27 grams what about the quantity of electricity that we already have so what about the 36 or 360,000 kilos how many so that's how you argue out the, you argue out the first principle then of course you do that 360,000 multiplied by 27 divided by the three faradays here and of course you get the answer if of course the student was able to work out that a half a mark and then the other half mark at that point maybe another student can decide first of all to work out the number of moles by just dividing the kilobs per as per this experiment over the three faradays so of course the student will get something 1.244 yeah so that is still uh, an okay then multiply that by 27 and that is question number 21 part b question number 22 you are to explain this observation articles made of copper they will turn green with the time what exactly happens copper react with atmospheric carbon fall oxide with the time we're saying with the time and uh, this results to formation of copper two carbonate that is green in color okay when you add aqueous ammonia this part b to a solution containing copper two ions what exactly happens deep blue solutions is for is formed why this this is due to the formation of a complex that we call tetraamine copper two ion i can you can see even the formula there remember what happens if you add few drops copper two hydroxide is formed and it dissolves you know it continues to dissolve into the aqueous ammonia to form that complex there question number 23 what is relative atomic mass this is the mass of an atom of an element compared to the mass of carbon 12 otherwise you can say it's compared to 1 over 12 the mass of carbon 12 remember carbon 12 has exactly 12.000 atomic mass unit a part b you're supposed to work out the relative atomic mass of a, an element x the formula of x and uh, carbon is given c x4 the percentage composition of carbon 3.6 percent the rest is x so the attached video again can take you through that three part b you given some two of course you're given a compound you're given a compound of 
uh, carbon and another element x and you're given the formula you're given the formula but you're given the percentage composition for carbon is 3.6 automatically the remaining for x will be 96.4 the relative atomic masses of carbon is given 12 the one for x is not given so the relative atomic mass of x is not given then we can go ahead and work out the number of moles 36 times uh, divided by 12 you get 0 0.3 moles on this other side we can just express that number of moles in terms of x 96.4 divided by x but according to the formula we already know the mole ratio it is 1 is to 4 and that means like if i can divide here by 3 if i are uh, not 3 necessarily so that means if i can divide here by 0 0.3 I'll get 1, and on this other side, I can as well divide by 0 0.3. So the whole of this expression here, it is equivalent to 4. That's what exactly I've done. 1 over 0 0.3 uh, multiplied by this other factor here equals to 4. Then I proceed to solve for x. So what do I do? I can multiply by 0 0.3 on both sides, 0 0.3, even on this side by 0 0.3 yeah just to eliminate that then 96.4 over x equals to 1.2 then on that case i'll cross multiply 1.2 x equals to 96.4 then i'll divide both sides by 1.2 and i will end up with 80.3 that is the answer so if i can award the max uh, working out with this the, the percentage for x a half a mark working out the number of moles a half a mark then of course there was uh, the working out of uh, of course the answer has half mark the other half mark yeah the other half mark was getting this ratio here just extracting the ratio from the formula maybe an alternative method for working out number 23b number 23b you can let the the relative atomic mass of x that you're not given remember the formula of the compound cx4 you can let the relative atomic mass of x be m represent it by using any letter or any symbol now we are talking about the molecular mass of this compound it will be 12 that is the relative atomic mass of carbon multiplied or added to 4m that is 4 multiplied by the relative atomic mass of x that we don't know now according to the question the percentage composition of carbon was 3.6 percent and that means 12 in a formula of x uh, cx4 12 over relative molecular mass will be 3.6 percent that's all i've done just to come up with an equation here then i proceed to solve for m just the way i've just solved that and i'll end up with 80.33 recurring, recurring there. With that, an alternative method good for you there. Question number 24. Preparation of carbon to oxide by dehydration of ethan, uh, ethendioic acid, other is called oxalic acid. The question, it is oxalic acid in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid. You get carbon to oxide, carbon full oxide and water. Another reagent that we can use instead of oxalic acid in this case, we can use methanoic acid. Otherwise, we can still use sodium methanoate, which will first of all be converted to methanoic acid, then dehydrated to obtain carbon to oxide. The question number 25, the student was expected to complete this diagram for the preparation of nitrogen. And of course, I have attached the video there to guide okay for number 25 the student was expected to complete a diagram actually this diagram was up to that point the student was to complete the diagram for the laboratory preparation of uh, nitrogen gas so this was the setup over here the solution of uh, ammonium chloride and sodium nitrate was in and uh, then the student was to complete that remember nitrogen is insoluble in water so the best method was to use over water method to collect the gas so just by drawing that 
indicating there is a gas jar there, a trough containing water, a beehive shelf, and the gas being collected, a half a mark. Then indicating the heating must be there, another half a mark. If the setup is very correct, workability, if the student scored a workability on that ladder, the setup could produce nitrogen, another one whole mark for the two marks. Remember, you know, some student will have the delivery tube through the gas jar. That's not practical. Or rather, maybe there was a disconnect. Or some can even have a delivery tube that is blocked. You know, we can have something, something like that. So the, the, the gas will not be connected. So workability mark goes just like that. So students, as you know, kindly uh, just make some smart drawing. You may not be an artist, but make smart drawing. Maybe I tell my students sometimes, take these uh, chemistry textbooks and go through those diagrams. Just master the diagram. Like for this, if a student had mastered how nitrogen is prepared, he could have, or she could have been able to draw the diagram without much of a problem. So go through the diagram, see how they are, and even the workability. Uh, question number 25, part B. Why the nitrogen obtained this way is more purer than that obtained from the air. That is isolation method. The nitrogen obtained from the air automatically do have noble gases as the impurities because argon and uh, its sisters are not removed. Question number 26. You're given hydrazine. Hydrazine, it's a part of the rocket fuel. You can see the bond energy that you're given in the table. The equation for the combustion of hydrazine. Uh, in presence of oxygen, that is to give nitrogen and water. You are supposed to work out the change in energy that will occur as a, as a result of that reaction. So the attached video again, keep following. Keep following to guide you. With question number 26, you are given a question for the uh, combustion of hydrazine, just uh, that rocket fuel. And the best thing you can do for you to work out the, uh, the change in enthalpy here or the energy change you have to open to draw the open bonding for these compounds and of course the products there and with that you can be able to see like in this case i'm supposed to work out the bond breaking energy bond breaking energy that is for these two reagents or reagents to react these bonds have to be broken so that you have the activated complex now the atoms can rearrange themselves so with that, I have a nitrogen-nitrogen bond to be broken. And uh, I have a hydrogen-nitrogen bond, four of them. One, two, three, four. So that one, I can start with that. Four uh, nitrogen-hydrogen bonds times the bond energy for one uh, type of bond there. I get the equivalent total energy to be broken. Then I have one nitrogen-nitrogen bond to break. The nitrogen nitrogen bond energy has been given here. Much by one, you get that. Then I have a oxygen oxygen double bond still on the reactant side, so it has to be broken as well. So if I can sum up the bond breaking energy, I will get 20 to 11 kilojoules. Yes, kilojoules, and that's where the student scores the first half mark. Uh, not half, and that's where the students cause the first one mark. With that, I can proceed now and do the bond formation energy. After the bonds have been broken, the atoms re rearrange themselves to form the product. Now, the bond formation. How many bonds have been formed? A nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond has been formed, so one of it. So I work out that. Then, of course, the bond energy was given, 944. Then I have a oxygen-hydrogen bond. That is two of them. Two times the bond energy uh, for the formation of uh, oxygen-hydrogen bond. That was given, 463. Times two of them, because I'm working with the two molecules of water. I get the equivalent energy there. Then I add. Something that you need to know. Bond breaking, if I want to break this pen here, I have to supply some energy. So the pen will absorb the energy. So bond uh, breaking is endothermic. 
that is endothermic it absorbs the substances absorbs energy bond formation on the other side is exothermic that's why it's negative so for me to get the total energy i just need to get the net energy the uh, energy as a result of endothermic process and then i add the energy as a result of the bond formation then i get the net energy which is in this case negative 585 kilojoules per mole remember this sign there it's very important good for one mark and of course the other one mark was here question number 27 the very last question you given that table of uh, the reduction potential of, of the halogens and then you have to explain using that table uh, what exactly will happen if aqueous bromine is added to a sample of water containing chlorides and iodide so if you can be guided by what i've written there po that is not pure box you know that's not post office box i don't know that means when the e value is positive the more the positive that means the stronger the oxidizing power of that species so po positive oxidizing agent the strongest oxidizing agent so for this case chlorine has the highest positive so it is the strongest oxidizing agent so for that case bromine will only oxidize the iodide ions because as you can see it has a more positive e value that is bromine has a more positive e value so it is a more oxidizing agent than iodine so it can oxidize the iodides to iodine but on the other side with the chlorine being uh, chlorine being more reactive or rather you can say it's more of it has more oxidizing power so it cannot be oxidized by bromine so there will be no change therefore bromine cannot displace chloride from the solution they, that cannot happen the two half cell equations i've written there they are necessary but with bromine and chloride ions no reaction part b of the same why do we need potassium iodide in uh, table salt just to provide iodine in our bodies that uh, can regulate the functioning of the thyroid to prevent a uh, condition called goiter good that is the end of the paper so thank you so much north carolina school of science and mathematics another friend in youtube i noted called emilia a nice uh, lab technician who also uh was uh, resourceful for this even other teachers the many examiners of uh, 233 stroke one thank you thank you thank you so much for my students kindly watch that uh, career compass see where you belong look at your career choice there and that is it others do not forget the very last bit of this video a nutshell of cbc the new system of education in Kenya. hello and uh, here is the segment i had promised i like keeping my promise a nutshell of cbc a new system of education in kenya so we need to understand this system because the system is here to stay and we should get used to it cbc another terminology that we'll be getting used to ni b e c f the basic education curriculum framework so what does cbc stand for c for competence b for best curriculum so it is competence based curriculum the b e f uh, c f that is b e c f the basic education curriculum framework now where are we coming from maybe i take you back to history 1963 a 7423 system of education was started as you, alana was to go through seven years of primary education four years of o level the ordinary level two years of advanced uh, level that is a level that is uh, form five and form six then three years in a tertiary uh, institution like a university then come 1985 i think dr sami was just one year that time another system 844 was introduced 
whereby the learner was to go through eight years in primary school, four years in high school or secondary school, then another four years in a tertiary institution. But that system has been there for quite some time. But with the time, it has become academic oriented. And uh, that is all about examination, what the student can recall. And that's where now the problem started. Now, there are two or three or more things that triggered a change of system of education in Kenya. One, the promulgation of a constitution, a new constitution in Kenya. We call it the Constitution 2010. It uh, uh, gave out or rather it uh, uh, brought out the issue of reform in education. And of course, that's where now the Vision 2030 was also uh, pronounced or rather was put in place. So there was a need to change the education system. And of course, things are changing. We are talking of a 21st century learner who is very different from now, maybe the 20th century learner. Now, this CBC, or what we're calling the Basic Education Curriculum Framework, how will it look like? First, there is the early year of education. That is what we're calling pre-primary education, PP1 and PP2. Student or other learners, aging four to five that is two years in pre-primary then we have what we're calling early year education that is lower primary school that is level one to level three age six to eight years now the student goes through another three years middle school education that is upper primary school age four to six uh, that is for level four to six now age 9 to 11 three years again then we have what you're calling middle school education or rather it's junior secondary now and this is a case where now the student go to level 7 to 9 age 12 to 14 and for three years then you have the senior school that is a senior secondary school whereby now the student will go through level 10 to 12 age 15 all the way to 17 three years and of course, eventually now the student at the age of 18 proceeds with a tertiary university for another uh, three years. That is basically the framework and how it will look like. For this segment, because I've just said I'm giving you a nutshell of CBC, I want to take you through some very important things that are in CBC that were not there before. The, we are calling them the core values that are uh, brought about by CBC. And these core values, they are just, they, they are just uh, principles or qualities, beliefs or standards that guides an individual to respond in a given way, uh, given another, a certain situation or a circumstances. And these values, as I have given there, uh, there are eight of them. The sense of love, responsibility, respect, unity, peace, patriotism, social justice and integrity i believe if a, if a student is able to go through this uh, system of education cbc and is able to acquire these values they are more important than the academic papers we've been having all through they are very important and maybe what follows is some indication what are the indication that the learner having gone through the system of cbc has acquired these uh values like the, the sense of love that is uh can be able to resolve conflict can forgive others when wrong among others you can see all the indicators that are in uh, under this value talk of responsibility again you can see the indicators how do you know that a learner is responsible go ahead respect yes how do you know a learner is respectful respect for self and even for others talk about unity we need unity unity is better and more important than even the paperwork because without unity there is no uh, progress talk of peace peace is very paramount then talk of patriotism the awareness of self responsibility as in the society uh, the uh, somebody who can obey the law among others patriotism Social justice, yes, a person who is democratic, you know, and respect the democracy of others. Talk about integrity. 
the issue of corruption for instance it's a, 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 a it's, it's a mammoth it's a giant it's something that is killing the society so if a student is able to go through the cbc system of education this person is able to acquire the sense of integrity otherwise that was just but a nutshell of cbc I think we should embrace this new system of education where now the learner will not just be there to absorb content, maybe cram some things, but this person will be able even to depict some of the values this person has learned even in the society. Otherwise, this is Dr. Sir.